Hi, everybody. Now I want to walk through one of the main uh, most interesting applications of principal component analysis in um, machine learning or data science. And that's the technique known as dimensionality reduction. So um, the problem that we face is that we have a data set which we can think of as a cloud of endpoints in a high dimensional, k dimensional space. So our, um, our samples, our endpoints, sit as dots in this very high dimensional space. There's n dots in RK. And we'd like to, for example, visualize this data or look for patterns in it or somehow extract meaningful information from it. And our mind is not set up to see high dimensional data, but uh, under some circumstances, principal component analysis allows you to pull out interesting information that you can then visualize. So remember that what, we're, what principal component analysis does is it finds directions in this high dimensional space in which the data is particularly spread out. So it finds scores that do a good job of distinguishing different points from each other. And it also helps you to find directions in the data which don't spread out the points very much, and therefore which don't have a lot of useful information. And that's what we're going to exploit here to try to um, reduce the dimension of our data. And that's what dimensionality reduction means. It means we're going to take data sitting in a very high dimensional space, and we're going to project it down into a much lower dimensional, for instance, a two-dimensional space where we can plot it. Now we're going to lose some information, a lot of information when we do that, but we're going to try to minimize the information that we lose in that process. So um, just a reminder that um, if we have our centered data matrix x0 and its covariance matrix d0, which is 1 over n x0 transpose x0, um, that d0 is a k by k matrix, where k is the number of features. And the principal directions in the data are a set of orthonormal eigenvectors for d0 with corresponding eigenvalues lambda i. So our, our um, I should say, u1 up to uk are the eigenvectors. They're the principal directions. And the variance in the direction of the i um, orthonormal vector is the ith eigenvalue. And if we order them in decreasing order, then we know that the direction that gives the largest variance is the direction u1, and there sigma1 squared is lambda1, and the smallest is lambda k. Now the only complication with that is that the eigenvalues may be, some of them may be the same. So when I talk about the largest eigenvalue, that isn't necessarily a uniquely determined one. I'm not going to worry about that that much, but when I talk about the largest or the s largest eigenvalues, there may be a choice to be made there, and you may, it may result that, that what I'm saying isn't uniquely defined. You may have to consider different possibilities. So there may not be a single direction of maximal variance. There may be uh, several directions of maximal variance. So the idea here, just to draw the picture one more time, is we have our cloud of points sitting in a high dimensional space. And let's say they're very spread out in this direction, and they're not so spread out in this direction, and maybe they're not so spread out in that direction. And so this would be sigma 1. This would be the u1 direction, and the variance here would be the large eigenvalue. And then these would be smaller. And this is what we're going to take advantage of. Now, we can generalize the idea of a principal direction into a principal subspace or a subspace of maximal variance, where instead of just picking a single direction uh, where the data is most spread out, we can think of a, a higher dimensional picture. So we have the data spread out in this high dimensional space. We can project it into a subspace such that the total variance in that subspace is large as possible. And uh, the mathematics of this are in the notes. Here I'm not going to worry about it so much, but the basic idea is that if you take not just the largest 
uh, principal direction, with the one with the largest eigenvalue, but you take a bunch of the largest ones, say the first two, the first two largest ones, or the first five largest ones, then you're going to get a subspace spanned by those two or five eigenvectors. And if you project the data into that subspace, it's going to be as spread out as possible among all five-dimensional or two-dimensional spaces. And uh, there's a, argu a mathematical argument in the book, in the notes, that shows uh, why that's the case. But I'm not going to worry about it right now. Instead, I want to talk about the strategy. The strategy, as I mentioned, is you have your data in a high-dimensional space, and you're going to project it into a lower-dimensional space that still captures a lot of the total variance. So here's a concrete example. Uh, this is a data set that I made up, and it has a hidden structure in it. And it consists of 200 points in 15-dimensional space. So the, uh, the number of samples is 200, and the number of features is 15, and there are 3,000 points in total. And you want to try to make some sense out of this data. What can you do? Well, when you have two features, you can make a scatter plot. But here you have 15 features. So one thing you could try is you could just make scatter plots of the two features, one against the other, and look and see if you see any pattern. Well, here I did that. I picked two of the features and I made a scatter plot, and you just see it's a blob. So we're not seeing anything very interesting there. And uh, you would have a total of 15 choose two choices, which is um, uh, something like 100 choices. So it's not really clear how this, this is going to get you anywhere. But if you carry it to its extreme, you get one of these <clears throat> density plots. So what this d graph is showing you is that um, it's actually only 10 of the features because I don't think it would... No, no, it's 15 features. So each diagonal box is a histogram of the of that feature. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 4. There are 15 features. Each of the diagonal boxes is a histogram of that feature. And you see some interesting things here. You see, for instance, here there seem to be two peaks, which suggests maybe that the data is divided up into two. There's actually two uh, groups of data. The other boxes are scatter plots of pairs of, of um, features. And again, here you see something interesting. For instance, here it looks like if you look at the 11th feature and the 14th feature, they split the data up into four components. And in, but in other places, here maybe you see two, two components, and here you see maybe three components, and here you see maybe three, and here you see maybe two. So it does seem like there might be some clustering structure in this data, but all these histograms are a little bit hard for the human mind to, to, uh, to, to uh, paste together. And um, looking at just the 11th and the 14th feature seems a little bit arbitrary at this point. So this is where principal component analysis comes into play. What we do is we look at the eigenvalues of the covariance matrix. So if you were using the, uh, the computer, what you would do is you would have your initial data matrix, x0, which is centered, so the coordinates, the column sum to 0. You would compute d0, which is 1 over n x0 transpose x0. And then you would look at the eigenvalues. You'd use the software to compute the eigenvalues lambda 1 down to lambda k. There are 15 eigenvalues. And then you plot those eigenvalues in decreasing order. So I've plotted them. Uh, there's 15 of them. The first one is here, and it's almost 2. And you see this the way it happens. The first one's almost 2. The second one's bigger than 1. The third one's like 0.75. The fourth one's point, still bigger than 0.5. And then there's this very sharp drop-off. And this is a very common pattern where uh, the first few eigenvalues are big, and then a bunch of the eigenvalues are small. And what this is saying is that if you were to take the four-dimensional space corresponding to these four eigenvectors, u1, u2, u3, and u4, 
and make a and think of them as as scores. The each of them is a kind of a a particular way to combine the features to make a new measure, and you make a matrix U whose columns are U1, U2, U3, and U4, and now you compute the scores. So remember here that U, each U is a K by one, is a K by one vector. So this is actually a K by four matrix. And when you do, do this multiplication, what you're going to get an, is an n by 4 matrix, where the for each row, what you have is the value of this synthetic feature, this score for each corresponding to each of these four orthonormal eigenvectors. So remember that here these the norms of the UIs are one and they're eigenvectors. Well, four dimensions is still a lot, um, but one thing you can notice is that if you take the sum one lambda one plus lambda two plus lambda three plus lambda four, and you divide it by all, the sum of all the lambdas, which is the total variance, this is almost 0.8. In other words. 80% of the data, 80% of the variance in the data is accounted for just by these four dimensions. And the remaining uh, 11 dimensions only account for 20% of the variance. So if you're trying to distinguish the points from each other, you should focus your attention on these four synthetic features or these four um, principal directions. Well, as I said, four is a lot to work with, but what if you just take the two largest eigenvalues, lambda 1 and lambda 2, and just take u1 and u2, which are the orthonormal, uh, corresponding orthonormal eigenvectors, and you compute x0 times the matrix u, where u with the columns are u1 and u2. So what you're doing here is you're taking a subspace of two dimensions in this 15-dimensional space, and you're projecting your data into that space. And now it's a two-dimensional space, so you can plot it in two dimensions. So these axes are measured in units of the principal, the first principal component and the second principal component. So they're not they're linear combinations of your original features. They're synthetic. But now look at the structure that you see. You see one, two, three, and then maybe, it's hard to tell, four or five clusters in the data. So the data has four or five clusters hidden in it. And the principal components are sufficient to, dis to, create, to distinguish it. So in other words, if you took a sample point and you just evaluated these two, computed these two scores, then you would maybe be able to tell apart these one, two, three, four, five different clusters of data. Now, if you were doing analysis of the data, your next step would be to choose points out of these five and see maybe if you could see some common feature of them. For example, if this was car data, maybe these clusters corresponded to where the car was manufactured. Who knows? Or And it would tell you that underlying the features that you looked at, like displacement or miles per gallon or whatever, some underlying feature, namely uh, some combination of those, ser serves to distinguish uh, some property that you didn't know about, like, for example, where the cars were, were manufactured. In genomic studies, what will happen is, and different techniques are used, and it's much more complicated, the data is much higher dimensional, but you might get a picture like this, and then they might each of these dots might be a cell, and the data might be uh, gene expression data, and when the dots are separated, then you might say, ah, these are nerve cells, these are muscle cells, these are... Um, uh, uh, nerve cells, muscle cells, blood cells, and these will these somehow buried in the data was a way to distinguish the different types of cells. 
So um, this is one of the most interesting applications of uh, principal component analysis as a way to take your data from 15 dimensions, represent it in two dimensions, and maybe sometimes distinguish it in a way which provides useful information.